This is Keys to the Shop, episode 249, the path to cooperative ownership with Christopher Perron and Shane Hindi with Phoenix Coffee Company. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the show, please do hit subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Share these episodes. When you get inspired by the content that you hear, you think somebody else would really benefit from this, share them with your friends, your team, and your staff. And also, if you love what we do on Keys to the Shop, and it's really helped you in your business or your career, it would be so awesome if you'd give us a five-star review on iTunes. You don't have to leave a a typed-out review, although that's really cool. Um, You can just hit the five stars there. And we're trying to get up to 200 five-star reviews by the end of this year. So many thanks to those of you who have already done so. Uh, This really helps the show out a lot and appreciate you all doing that. Now, I want to let you know that uh, Keys to the Shop also offers consulting and coaching. Keys to the Shop Consulting is all about helping you thrive as a coffee business through your operations, your people, and the quality of what you serve. If you're just starting out in the coffee business, opening your own coffee shop, uh, we can help you get started on the right foot. Or if you've already been established as a company, but you want to level up and you want to refine your operations, we can help you there too, both in person or over the phone. There's a lot of ways that we can help you at Keys to the Shop Consulting. Just email me, chris at keys to the shop.com. And we can have a conversation about how Keys to the Shop Consulting can help you. Again, that email for Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keys to the shop. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. You know, when you start a coffee shop, when you get into the coffee business, one of the most excruciating decisions you have to make is what kind of equipment to put in your shop. It can be very, very confusing, and you're not really sure if you're going to get the best uh, and if it's just going to be a mistake down the road. And that's why I love working with Prima Coffee, because not only do they pick the best equipment from all over the world to offer their customers, but they also work with you to make sure you're getting the right equipment for your situation. And when you go to their website, prima-coffee.com, they have a ton of resources that helps you gain knowledge about that equipment, uh, care for it, uh, the preventative maintenance. They also have resources that teach you how to make coffee and how to improve your coffee skills because they're really about more than equipping you with equipment, but also equipping you with the knowledge and the skills to succeed in coffee. So if you're in the market for espresso machines, grinders, brewers, or even things like undercounter refrigeration and all the small wares you can really think of, then my advice is definitely go to prima-coffee.com and let them help outfit you with what you need to succeed in specialty coffee. Again, that's prima-coffee.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by the wonderful Pacific Foods Barista Series. This is the line of plant-based performance beverages that perform on bar because they are highly tested in the field by professional baristas. And uh, of course, they're not going to put something out there unless it is going to create an amazing texture, perfect for latte art. It's going to stand up to the heat from steaming, and it's going to let the coffee shine in your beverage. It's not going to have an overwhelming flavor. It's going to really keep the beverage focused on the coffee. And as I've noticed people ordering far more plant-based beverages these days than even regular milk, uh, you want to offer your customers the best. And in my mind, it's no contest. Pacific is the leader in this field for a reason. And I think that you should taste the difference for yourself. See how they perform on your bar. Let your baristas play around with it on the bar. And I think your customers and your baristas are absolutely going to love this. So go to the website, pacificfoodservice.com. You can follow the link in the show notes. Whether it's hemp, almonds, coconut, oats, soy, or rice, If your goal is a superior plant-based beverage experience for your customers, then the Pacific Barista Series is the way to go. Okay, everybody. Well, today we're going to be talking with Shane Hindi and Christopher Ferran of Phoenix Coffee Company in Cleveland, Ohio. And they have recently converted this 30-year-old local coffee business into an employee-owned worker cooperative. Phoenix Coffee employs 37 people across their five northeastern Ohio coffee shops. Plus, they have a wholesale coffee roastery located in the city of Cleveland. Christopher and Shane began working toward cooperative ownership for the company a few years ago. 
Their goal in all of this is to create a more democratic workplace and provide profit sharing for baristas who have traditionally had uh, pretty limited long-term growth opportunities in the coffee industry. This is something of a natural progression in that it was aligned with the values that Phoenix Coffee already had. And in today's conversation with Christopher and Shane, we will be talking about the details of what it took to get to this place as a company, uh, their goals and the challenges that were inherent within the process of becoming an employee-owned worker cooperative. Now, if we're people-first-oriented companies and leaders, this is one of the models of doing business that really does empower your staff and open up more opportunities to them through collective ownership. And after this conversation, you'll find that it's not necessarily an easy transition, but maybe something worth pursuing if it fits for what your goals are as a business. And on top of that, this could be an option for you also uh, in terms of building resiliency and lowering turnover for your staff in a post-COVID retail world. And we talk about a little bit of that too in this conversation. So without further ado from me, here now is my interview with Christopher Ferran and Shane Hindi of Phoenix Coffee Company. Well, Christopher, Shane, welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm excited to get to talk to you both today. Thanks for having us on. Agreed. We're excited to have the conversation. Uh, big news out of uh, Cleveland. You're you're doing some big things with the structure of your organization, and this collective ownership model is something I think a lot of us have been hearing a lot about in the coffee industry lately. And um, when I got the press release for this, uh, it was really fascinating. And I know you both have been up there to, uh, to Phoenix Coffee, do some training with your managers once, and have been aware of Phoenix for quite a long time. Amazing business. And this new development is, is just really interesting. And before we dive into that, I, I wanted to sort of get some background on how you both became the owners or came to be the owners of Phoenix Coffee. Great. So, yeah, Phoenix has actually been around for 30 years. Um, it was founded by a gentleman named Carl Jones, who formerly found Arabica Coffee. Uh, and over that 30 years, Carl actually exited the company. Uh, his uh, former ex or his former wife, Sarah, ended up assuming ownership of the company. And about uh, between 10 and six, seven years ago, Christopher and I uh, ended up with a minority, minority share. Uh, and that minority share was really... Uh, a recognition of our efforts, our unique contributions to the well-being and redevelopment of the company. Uh, I specifically joined the company about six and a half years ago uh, in a business development sense most often. I was working heavily on the finance, on the operations uh, in a very unique way. You know, we had 45 employees at the time. And I was really the only one doing some critical work on the financial structure of the company. Um, quite frankly, I didn't really get paid much to do it. Uh, so my minority stake in the company was in recognizing of those efforts uh, and, and rewarding of those efforts uh, since I wasn't well compensated for them when they happened. Um, Christopher's story is similar, a little bit different, uh, but we, it's of note that we were both minority partners in the business. We were not the majority owner at any point. Yeah, I mean, like Shane said, we, we were both minority partners and uh, navigated Phoenix through a, a rather tumultuous period. Um, and in recognition of that, uh, the majority owner at the time uh, a agreed to a structure when we officially took over operations of the company that we would have a, a minority stake uh, in recognition and of our contribution, as well as somewhat tying us to, to the fate of the business, to basically a, a cheerleading, hey, keep going. Um, and, so, and so that gave us the, uh, the authority that we needed uh, to continue to grow the company and to, to pursue some other directions. Okay. And I, I imagine that authority sort of grew as you were minority uh, owners in the, the business at first, uh, that your authority and your involvement grew from there, right? Right. It all kind of happened at once, actually. Uh, we had been unofficially running the company uh, for about two years. And then in early 2016, we came to an operating agreement with our majority partner, um, that officiated our roles as the operating partners of the company, as well as distributed our equity stake in the company. Uh, and that was solidifying uh, an operating structure that Christopher and I 
thought was supportive of our uh, functional roles in the company, as well as compensating uh, in a way that we felt just and fair given our efforts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as your uh, roles increased in their scope and you became sort of the, the figureheads for, for leadership in the company, um, the, the question of values really comes into play in terms of what you wanted to do with this company. It's an old company. There's a lot of um, momentum behind you know the efforts and the operations. And so you, you I imagine, have to have a pretty solid grasp on what you wanted at the end of your efforts uh, based on some values. So what were your goals and what values were they based on when you first started? I mean, Phoenix, when I started uh, as a barista back in 2010, uh, so 10 years ago, had much of the same values and core culture as it does today. I think really what we did is we identified it, articulated it, and expanded it beyond the simple cafe environment. We took it into our supply chain and our sourcing and our overall marketing philosophy, our communication strategy, the way that we think and talk, um, as well as the way that we interact with each other. Um, and so we tried to make a more holistic and inclusive and integrated approach to the values that were already extant. And furthering what Christopher was mentioning, it was really figuring out the business structures and financial structures that would support those values. Um, in a way, this cultural evolution has been underway for 25 years. Uh, we've always had a playful, democratic conversation within the company. Uh, that didn't always translate to business success uh, and quite frankly, oftentimes put us in quite a bit of debt. Uh, so we've really spent four to five years at this point really working on our business structure, uh, making some tough decisions, figuring out where we could cut costs, where we could generate revenue. Uh, to build a sustainable financial model that would support a lot of these oftentimes uh, less financially advantageous decisions that align with these values. On uh, this next jump into collective ownership is a further, uh, you know, undertaking in what we look at as our long-term financial sustainability, where we think this model will work even better and be more aligned and integrated with the rest of our values-based decision-making. Is it fair to say that the fact that it wasn't as integrated before, but the value in, in the pursuit of it was there, it, 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 that's the reason why it produced some tension and, as you say, like kind of put you in some hot water occasionally? Oh, we spent a lot of years making decisions without a lot of financial insight. Um, mm. And it's really important, you know, we'd like our finances to support everything we do and truly enable us to do. Uh, but at times, I don't want to say we were too committed to our values, but uh, we made decisions emotionally without considering all the impacts, whether they be operational or financial, and that created some problems. Uh, so in doing this move towards, you know, distribution and democracy, uh, we try to be very considerate of all of the impacts on all aspects of our business. So we can really look at the long-term viability and sustainability, sustainability of the company. Distribution of power and, and having strong values and some compass doesn't really matter if you can't continue the jobs and the positions that, that, we're, uh, that we've created and sustained thus far. So it's, it's really important to understand that everything has to be viewed through the context of that, that business lens. Um, and that is, I think, a struggle for a lot of coffee companies, um, particularly ones who are motivated to, to create a better world. And so it's, it's trying to find that, that perfect center of the Venn diagram of where our values can actu be actualized in some sort of way. That makes a lot of sense. I just read a blog about that subject about like structured generosity, and the fact that you could really have good intentions, but you don't necessarily have the structures to support those good intentions, and they turn pretty sour pretty quick. Like just you know, that emotional decision that you make, like you were talking about, Shane, uh, that just kind of is nice. Is a nice thought, but in action, it is not sustainable. And it seems like what you've you've done is, like you say, another step toward making that a more sustainable reality for yourselves and your um, your staff. And I guess my question would be, um, what when you talk about playfully, you know, uh, engaging in like a democratic uh, run coffee bar, 
Like, what things were you doing to try to make steps towards that? Before this decision was made, what things were you doing to involve people democratically and distribute power? Well, I, I think I think before we even get there, we need to understand what Phoenix is. There are a lot of, uh, well, not a lot. There are, there are a handful of cooperative coffee shops around the country. What Phoenix is, we have five cafes, brick and mortar stores, and we also have a wholesale roastery. Um, Across the company, we employ, I think, 37 people right now. Uh, so it's a little bit more complicated structurally and in terms of the different sorts of roles that we have. Uh, so when we're looking at a, a co-op, it's within the lens of that larger organization rather than an individual coffee bar. I guess the question then is, in terms of all those moving parts and you know sections of the business, when you sought to create a, a more... Um, I would say equitable or you know distributed power model before this move that you just made. What did that look like? So about four years, well, five years ago, actually, we did our first profit sharing bonus. Uh, we had had some you know, very, very, very naive conversations on becoming employee owned uh, almost six years ago, uh, around the time I first started the company. Had no idea what we were diving into at that point. Uh, born out of this desire to. Uh, increase equity. Uh, we didn't have a, you know, organizational or a legal structure that really entailed that. So we just started doing a year-end bonus that was based on a little bit of tenure and a little bit of pure existence in the company. Uh, and that alone, that first marker of giving away this profit-sharing bonus that was uh, shared and based on the well-being of the company, uh, really created a lot of commitment through the company. Um, you know, so. Furthering at that point, which truly really started about five years ago, uh, we started including uh, as much transparency into our process as we can. Uh, so we started publishing our transparency report, uh, which is both an internal and external document because we want to share everything that we are doing with both our staff and the public. So, you know, there's mutual accountability. Um, you know, beyond that, we actually are a very flat organization and have very little, you know, organizational overhead. When we look at the admin, there's really only two dedicated organizational staff, and that's Christopher and I. Uh, but beyond that, we augment our team with a lot of uh, functional additions to other roles. So our graphic designer uh, is actually also a barista at the company. Our social media coordinator is also a barista. So we found ways to basically take roles that we might otherwise offer uh, to an outside agency or an outside contract and bring them internal to the company. So as a result, we've had this kind of shared decision making uh, to promote the well-being of the entire organization by accessing people in any way we can, um, which has also allowed us to save money over time and find more ways to do so. Um, so at this point, it's been scrambling and any opportunity we can find a way to kind of reinvest and share power within our existing network we have. Um, and at the moments we've had these kind of uh, opportunities to be distributed with either power or resources, we've had such a strong response that's only fed our fire to find new ways to do this. Um, and it was time, you know, that we take an actual huge step like a employee ownership conversion, just to enable ourselves to do the next round or do even more and speed up that process. So what was the catalyst then uh, for taking that big step since you know, you've know you been pursuing this on your own and seemingly there's been a, a positive response from your staff as they uh, you know get these bonuses, there's all this transparency and distributed power. What, what kind of made you decide here now is the next step to take it even further? I mean, it's in some ways, it's a business decision, like we were talking about. We, we've had a majority owner for, for years who, you know, we get along with, uh, but that does ultimately have a financial impact on the business. And when we're talking about equity, uh, baristas are working day in, day out, especially during COVID. They're, they're literally risking their health and safety at times in order to, to serve coffee to the public and to continue to grow our community. And we have a majority owner who hasn't been operationally involved. And that didn't feel comfortable for her. And it didn't feel comfortable for us. Uh, and so it felt like the natural place to navigate the business to in order to recognize the, the contribution that the baristas make, the contribution that our production team has made. Um, and, 
and really move the business to a healthier place. And our, our baristas have been here for a long time. Our average tenure is over three years. Hmm. Uh, more than 50% of our staff has been here for, for greater than a year. So th- we're already talking about folks who've, who've committed a lot and who've contributed a lot. And it, it feels like the only real equitable way to have them share in the success of the business. So then what changes, let's say, in this model from what you're currently doing to a year from now when this model has sort of settled in a little bit, what are the changes that a staff and yourselves should be experiencing? Settle in is truly the right term. Um, <laughs> you know, this, uh, this co-op, the conversion itself closed about uh, two weeks ago at this point. Uh, and we put out a lot of announcements, a lot of internal uh, communications to our staff and All of them stated, this is going to be a huge announcement, and it's not going to feel like anything in the immediate aftermath. Um, (laughs) Really, everything up until this point has been a business conversion and the business sale. Um, So all of our efforts have just been getting to the point where we can be legally called a co-op and buy the business from our former majority owner. Uh, So moving forward, we're really looking at uh, more of the cultural and internal organizational pieces. So in March of this year, we're planning on uh, offering our employee owners or our employees the first opportunity to buy their employee ownership share and become a true employee member of the company. Uh, That includes Christopher and I. Uh, We will have the same employee ownership as everyone else who opts to have that in the company. Um, And at that point, we'll have the opportunity to develop our first uh, board. Uh, That board is going to be... uh, based on elected class A members, uh, plus a few members of some external financing that has helped us convert this deal. Um, And that board's gonna have oversight of the business where previously pretty much all the decisions stopped with Christopher and I, uh, and some approval from our former majority owner. Uh, So, you know, it's really tapping some of our long-term employees uh, who are going to be the democratic voice of the rest of their coworkers uh, to form this board and really make decisions collectively uh, from a group of individuals who are connected to the day in and day out of the business. Uh, So, you know, it's really going to take six months to get that group together. uh, And then I'm expecting it to take another six months to a year to figure out all of the decisions that that board is going to make, uh, what decisions are still going to be held within a role, um, you know, we're still a business. We still have to operate. We still have specializations. Um, so it's going to take some time just to shake out um, how the operating structure is going to change. We're not expecting drastic changes. We have really skilled individuals who make really good decisions. Uh, but having that oversight and having those decisions that were formerly made by one person spread amongst a trusted community and elected community, uh, we're excited to see how that continues to create engagement and involvement from employees. Yeah, that was my next question, I suppose, was the specialization versus, you know, having a board, either, you know, historically, when people think about boards in organizations, they think slow progress and or confusing um, political, et cetera, like internal politics. And I guess, you know, thinking about what people might be, you know, asking themselves right now, listening to this is that, well, it's just quicker to have one person making a decision about, you know, this area over here in the business rather than submitting it to a board. So even though this is the paint is still wet, so to speak, you know, what is your gut in terms of how to make a different, how to differentiate between what requires specialist role based decision making and authority versus what is put over to the the board and the collective, that can be a bit of a slower process, but a more distributed one. Well, I, I think it's important to, to recognize that there are different forms of co-ops. There are different levels of uh, democracy and different levels of you know re- republic re- Republican representation that exist in, in cooperative structures. And a lot of that is defined by an entity's bylaws. Some of that should tell specifically what the powers of the board are uh, and, and so on. Uh, in this case, we do have some of that very clearly articulated. So the, the powers of the board are basically to protect and ensure the long-term health of the organization. And one of the powers it has is to hire general managers of the association. And so Shane and I were hired by the interim board 
uh, for a term to run the day-to-day -day operations and overall strategy of the company. Um, anything that would require a large expenditure, for example, signing a new lease to open a new store or to close close the store would require board approval. Um, and therefore the, the member owners would have to sign off on that. But for example, a specialized position, uh, I am the coffee buyer. I will continue to be the coffee buyer. I'm the only one who has the training and experience to do that. Um, so it, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to, to bring in a, a ton of voices and have a ton of cooks in the kitchen for, for that specific role, particularly since I have the integrated purchasing plan, logistics experience and so on. Um, so it, it is going to function still as a business, but in terms of protecting and holding the larger container of the culture and, and the company as an entity, that will be shared among all of us. I think, I think it's really interesting to note that we are partnering with a Cleveland-based nonprofit uh, in this deal. And their mission, they're the Evergreen uh, Corporation, the Evergreen Corporation of Families, their mission as a nonprofit is to create jobs in inner city communities and help individuals build wealth. Uh, they have incubated a few employee-owned companies in Cleveland. They've helped convert a couple of companies in Cleveland. And they're supporting us in developing uh, employee culture and wealth building uh, curriculum so that we can engage our potential employee owners uh, in some development. Uh, we're going to be asking those employee owners to evaluate the business in a way that they never have. And that's going to take time to develop. Um, so as we settle in, you know, we need to give our future employee owners, co-employee owners, uh, time to develop that insight and that skill where, you know, for many of my uh, coworkers, they've never seen an income statement and a balance sheet. So as the board, if we are reviewing those documents, we're going to need to make sure that we're all uh, capable of digesting and chatting in about them if we're truly evaluating them to look at opening the cafe and gain approval on opening the cafe. Um, so we're, we're pretty grateful for Evergreen and their insights uh, to help us look at this next year and making sure we're being a real, realistic to tack of, tackle some of these conversion-based challenges uh, you know, and make sure that we are equipped to act democratically and have a plan uh, to get to the point when we truly are equipped as a group of worker owners. That would be the question, I guess, the, that someone might ask is the, you know, these, these folks don't necessarily have the training to know whether or not closing a store is prudent or keeping a store open is prudent. Uh, and so I'm glad you brought that up because that, that kind of answers the question in terms of most people's fear would be somebody who just says, no, that would, that would suck to close that store. I guess we're not going to close it <laughs> and not have a lot of um, substance behind those decisions or, you know, the creating a new problem of emotional decision-making where before you were talking about how the emotional decision-making in terms of equity without systems and structure got you in trouble, but then you know, preventing emotional decision making within this new structure seems like the challenge. Also, we have we have a built-in period of transition. Um, right now, for the first three months of the co-op's existence, we don't have any worker owners, so we have an interim board. Um, and the purpose of that is to kind of slowly bring in uh, worker owners and train them and give give them the financial literacy and the tools that they need to to functionally operate on the board and provide that oversight role. Uh, and, and that is so that we don't all collectively come together and, and call a vote and say, all right, we're all going to raise our wages 50% on day one or, or something <laughs> like that. That puts us in a precarious position. We laugh because it's happened uh, at, at other co-ops. So I, I still want it to happen. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, that is the reason for uh, you know this, this sort of ramp up or, or cooling off period so that we can all get our sea legs under us and understand what it, what that actually means to function as a co-op. And, you know, Christopher and I had a conversation with a semi-related business. They're a composting service we actually work with. Um, and they're investigating their own conversion into employee ownership. They're a much younger company. Uh, you know, their crew is smaller and works together and their journey is much, much different than ours. Uh, so it's been interesting in talking to Evergreen and these other net or partners within the community about just how different every single one of these conversions has looked, whether financially, whether within the bylaws conversation, uh, whether looking at how we need to equip the staff. And I think that's been one of my biggest learning moments 
all together is that there is no one set path and each of these conversions to employee ownership looks drastically different. Um, and it's been fun to have these conversations, but in ways it's isolating where you can gain a little bit from each conversation, but you're really charting your own path and looking at your individual needs as an organization and uh, figuring out what the best two to five year plan to fully execute as a co-op looks like. Well, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because your, your collection of people, uh, that your collective is a unique collective, you know, and it, it, it must be tempting to really want to get something very prescriptive and say, well, this model works for everybody. So you can just plug this in and it'll work for your business too. But then, you know, without you doing the homework and the due diligence on your end, it, probably anyone who approaches it that way probably has it backfire pretty quickly. And you also have to realize that cooperative laws are different all around the country. So there is a certain amount of legal expertise that is required. I, I feel like we have been opening Pandora's box to a lot of people in the Cleveland community. Uh, many of our customers are very excited, but have a very limited knowledge of the inner workings of a co-op. And when you pull back that box, it sounds quite simple. You pull open up that box just a bit, you realize how complex of a conversion this is, how complex of an organizational undertaking this is. Um, and it's, you know, there's not a lot, especially in Cleveland, uh, there's not a lot of co-ops. Um, so it's been a big learning moment personally for me uh, and just institutionally and then also culturally, I'm getting approached by businesses left and right for my insight because they're now thinking of this and don't know anyone else to talk to. Mm. Um, so it's an exciting time. Uh, I do feel like a trendsetter in Cleveland a bit. Uh, <laughs> I'm also almost a little bit tired of talking to it at this point because it's been my you know, conversation for almost four weeks straight at this point. <laughs> the role you signed up for, I guess, right? Yeah. But it'd be so nice to just get to do the work. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's why I'm glad you're making this podcast, Chris. I can just send it to the podcast. Th yeah, Thank please. <laughs> I, I hope this takes some of that load off of your back. Um so a question I guess I have is, you know, going forward in business as co a coffee shop in times of COVID, I know that people are looking for different models for business. And I've even said on the show that creating a more professionalized version of the barista role to the future where, you know, as you have done with a lot of your baristas that work various parts of the business, um, this is, you know, creating a more resilient business. And I want to know why you think, because I know we talked before uh, the episode, you really do think that this is a good model or some uh, an idea that people maybe should look into for the future of uh, retail coffee shops or coffee businesses. Why do you think that is? What are your thoughts there? I, I think one of the bigger conversations that we've been having this year in coffee uh, is just surrounding the notion of equity. There was a wage transparency movement earlier this year where folks were were going and adding their wages, their experience, their their racial ethnic identities to spreadsheets for cities across the U.S. And high turnover, uh, the the health and safety risks of of doing hospitality work, and the lack of equity are three major conversations. And all of those things can be somehow addressed through this structure, this operating structure. Um, and I think that if, well, it's our hope that if we give a piece of ownership to the folks who do the work, that we are going to see long-term commitment and growth and richness of this company and this culture. Um, but it also may have distinct financial advantages depending how your company is currently. You know, we see, over the four or five years that Christopher have, and I have really been leading Phoenix, uh, that work is only, the work that we've been able to do collectively is only possible because we've had a consistent staff. Um, we have had coworkers who have truly invested and been with us for four to five years. At our introductory co-op uh, call, once we announced to the staff and had our first summer town hall to answer questions, uh, more than half of our staff have been with the company for more than four years. Um, so that amount of commitment, that amount of knowledge, that amount of insight has truly been what has led us to uh, the point where we can convert and has allowed us to redo our finances and get to a better point of sustainability. Uh, 
And I look at what we need to do to take that work even further as an organization, provide even more. Uh, we have a goal of truly providing middle class jobs for our coworkers. Uh, that's going to take even higher levels of commitment from everyone. Uh, so we need to provide the operating structure and the benefit structure to do that. I'm looking at a truly distributive financial structure where employee owners are eligible for patronage, um, having the capital investments and the balance sheet of the company uh, distributed in a different way that's outside from a majority owner and the risks that involved uh, provides these benefits. Um, so I look at this and a lot of the conversations I've been having with uh, my coworkers at this point who are looking at becoming employee owners involve the added commitments, added benefits, and added rewards. Um, and if we can be that model within Cleveland, we can create larger equity within the community. Um, it's going to take creative work. There's no model for it, but in every instance, every time I look financially, every time I look uh, personnel-wise, every time I looked culturally, uh, the benefits seem to align with the work that we're trying to do to progress people's lives. The, the, we're in a really unique place right now with COVID because there are a lot of cafes that are down 60, 80, 90% and operators who are in deep trouble uh, looking to take on more debt or, or facing financial ruin in some other way. And this could offer a way for those operators to exit uh, and for the, the thing that they wanted to build to live on in, in a different form. Um, and I, I think that if, if they were to explore it and reconcile uh, the fact that they, it would not be theirs anymore necessarily, uh, it, it can be a way to preserve the jobs and preserve the impact that they've made on the community that they've been serving. Yeah, that it makes sense. There is a place in Lexington in Kentucky here as a bookshop that used to be privately owned and became a worker co-op once the owners exited, still in existence. Uh, so similar to what you're saying. Um, and Shane, I was thinking as you were talking about the benefits and then the risk, I was curious about how that works in terms of uh, passing along the risk of business ownership and equity stakes in the company. Um, you know, a lot of people who are baristas, you know, they, they don't want the risk of ownership because they can just walk away from the job, you know, um, and, and it's not, they don't have to pay any debt. There's no collective debt, I guess, that they take on for the company. How does that work? Because I imagine there's, there's an element of risk involved in this model. Uh, correct. There is an element of risk, uh, in negotiating this deal, part of the reason it's taking so long is to figure out uh, the financing structure that best addresses that risk, uh, best distributes it, and creates kind of the perfect medium between shared risk uh, and operational efficiency. Um, so we've been fortunate. We have unsecured debt going into the deal where, you know, the association, the cooperative association that we have formed is guaranteeing the debt, and that is not tied to any one person. Uh, so it removes that risk of, you know, as a barista who might, you know, with tips be making 17 to 20 bucks an hour, you're not on the hook for hundreds of thousands of dollars in shared debt. Okay. Um, because that is a major concern for our staff. Um, we've also been generous or been fortunate with Evergreen, who is taking an equity stake in the co-op that we will buy back over time. Um, so again, it's another way to kind of reallocate that risk that would be on an ownership group. Um, it's also been a challenge, you know, in trying to finance this deal. It was very hard to work with traditional banks because they were always looking for one or two personal guarantees. Right. Uh, when you say there's not going to be an 80% owner, they kind of balk at you and just say, how is this going to work? Um, <laughs> So it took a lot of creativity. Again, we have a wonderful partner in Evergreen who's been willing to address that with us and you know, help us create some creative financing structures to create the perfect amount of risk for the employee, owner, um, and an appropriate amount of risk for the company as a whole. Um, in addition, uh, in our bylaws, we require employee owners to purchase their membership share. Uh, we think that's really important. Uh, it's a symbolic investment that they are giving up their hard-earned money for their ownership stake in the company. Um, so we've created ways that they can do that over time through a payroll deduction. Uh, their benefits do start as soon as uh, they sign up for those deductions. Uh, but as an owner, they need to make that very tangible investment. 
Um, and it's been a balance of making sure that the amounts fit within the earnings potential, uh, the cash flow of a barista. Um, and we've had some good guidance from some partners, some existing co-ops who've really helped guide how we uh, work that into our bylaws. So say somebody uh, says, like, they opt into this. Like, you could be a barista at Phoenix and not be uh, bought into this, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, in our bylaws, we have uh, requirements that everyone must meet uh, to be eligible to become an employee owner. Um, there's a length of time you have to work for the company. Uh, there's the agreement to purchase your share. You have to be in good standing. Um, so, you know, off the bat, not everyone's going to be eligible. And then there is that question of whether employees want to undertake the additional risks, responsibilities that go along with this. So it's a bit of a long game on there, and they they know they pay in for that share, and they got skin in the game. But I mean, uh, realistically speaking, I mean, even given the trajectory of your year over year growth, things like that, I mean, what what do you tell people they can expect uh, in terms of return on that investment uh, within a year, two years? I mean, how does that end up being some uh, a net gain for somebody who's bought in as an owner? Well, I think one of the interesting things is you don't actually lose uh, your money unless the company goes under. Um, so any investment in the company is actually held in the capital reserve and returned when you uh, redeem your employee owner stake. So if you do leave the company, you're not allowed to keep your ownership, obviously. It's worker owner, not mm -hmm. owner owner. Um, so as long as the company stays viable, that will be returned upon exit from the company. Uh, and that is honestly the deep learning that we're going to have to do with a lot of our new worker owners is look at projections, look at budgeting um, so that they have an understanding of, you know, will this pay off in three years? Are we going to reinvest heavily in the next two years? Will that reinvestment delay profits until year three or year four until those, you know, cash outflows really start returning? Um, more than anything, as we've acted, we want to be transparent. Um, and so in our culture and wealth building, we're going to do uh, financial literacy training where we can look at a five-year financial statement and we can see when that money's coming in. So maybe if someone who's only interested in being around for another two years, they look at the long-term outflow and they say, I'm not going to see a huge return. You know, I'll just hang out as an employee. I'll support you all in doing this. Uh, but maybe someone else has a better opportunity who's looking at being at the company for five years. Um, so, you know, it's an open conversation. It's an ongoing conversation. With this move, we are moving to an open book management style uh, where hopefully if our employees have questions, they have access to that financial information so that they can make uh, an informed decision about the company's well-being and their own personal financial well-being. Okay, so then how do the benefits actually get triggered so that you know people see more money in their bank accounts under this new structure? Well, that has to, that has to be defined by the bylaws. Um, so that that would be something that requ would require the board to vote to to amend because right now it's it's strictly based on uh, profit sharing um, rather than and and obviously if you raise wages across the company that will impact the the total bottom line. Uh, we 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 do have a universal wage scale for for baristas and managers right now. Uh, and that will continue to be in effect. Um, that I have a feeling we don't know this yet because we just had our first board meeting, but I have a feeling wages are going to fall under day-to-day -day operations, which is under uh, Shannon and my purview. Okay. So what people get paid, I imagine it's still determined on the job that they are doing. I mean, or, or does everyone get paid the same amount in, in, you know, as I, as I ask that, uh, I'm wondering about, you know, when owners think about this, they're thinking, well, you know, it's my company. I started it. I deserve, you know, to get paid a lot more because I have the risk, first of all, we just talked about that. But second of all, you know, that's, that's you know, it's my company, <laughs> basically. Um, so how do, you, how do you approach pay, practically speaking, a, across a cooperative when it comes to, you know, different levels of pay? We, we def still have different roles, and each different role requires a different level of training, different level of specials specialization and expertise, uh, and has a different amount of risk and responsibility associated with it. In other words, uh, higher consequences of failure. And so we do have different pay rates associated with each of those sort of tiers of roles. Uh, however, the employee owner share is equal. 
across the company. So Shane and I, uh, who are the general managers of the company, will have equal shares as your full-time barista who's been here for however long is required and has been accepted as an employee owner. That means at the end, the profit sharing would be split equally. Okay, so that position outside of the uh, profit sharing would get paid uh, the, the base salary differently based on that criteria. And does the board get to vote on that? So, you know, we don't, we are still working on this transitional board. Again, we're going to, at least in our origin, and as we transfer in, keep most of the operational decision-making within roles. Um, where the board will come into play is the board is going to approve a budget. Uh, we're going to have to present a budget to the board each year, which will have a payroll number in it. You know, um, So we have to present that, and the board will approve that. And within there, there will be uh, conversation around wage levels. Uh, but that, you know, the board's responsibility is not just to pay, employee pay, it's to the overall well-being of the company. Mm -hmm. And there will always be a tension between how much individuals are getting paid and the overall bottom line of the company. Uh, as the financial director of Phoenix, I have felt that the past seven years. Um, <laughs> and that's, it's an ambiguous moment where there's going to have to be learning and conversation. Uh, People have voice. They can, you know, open and dialogue on pay rates within the budget. Um, at some point, we're going to have to make a decision, and there's going to be people who are more invest, be more invested in that uh, within the decision. Um, particularly those who have the financial skill sets and are analyzing the financials. Uh, and there is, a, you know, I look at it too. Is there is a trade-off? The higher our payroll budget lines are the lower the profit sharing bonus is uh, just because higher expenses equals lower profit. Um, so it might take some moments of organizational tension to discuss and get there. It might take some heavy learning. Mm. Uh, it might lead to a redone budget where our labor percentage goes up a little bit uh, and the profit share goes down. Uh, but hopefully being more transparent, creating uh internal structures and board processes that include dialogue uh, lead to more organizational learning and conversation so that everyone, you know, maybe doesn't get what they exactly want, but understands the decisions that are being made and see how they fit into the overall structure of the organizational well-being. I can, I can imagine a world where uh, we, we currently provide an HRA for our full-time employees, a healthcare reimbursement. And I can imagine a world where the employees vote that they want to increase or decrease that proportionately to the amount of take-home pay that they get, uh, since it would still be sort of the same employee benefit compensation package. Um, that is one area where I can, I can see that possibly changing in the future. Mm, and, and theoretically, I guess they could vote to cap certain upper management salaries or you know, things like that so that there's no risk of that going over a certain amount where it would negatively impact the downstream benefits. Yeah, the board the board could certainly do that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, this obviously this is two weeks in and um, that you have such a uh, open uh, model and dialogue and obviously your transparency, you know, your dedication to transparency is uh, quite well known at this time. I've read your transparency report in the past and it's really wonderful. So um, I guess the question I have here is uh, one of two that you know I want to ask before we wrap up is, um, do you think that this decision was easier for you all to make as you came in to the company, not necessarily the traditional way, like you didn't start the company of Phoenix Coffee. Um, and emotionally speaking, I guess, somebody who did like put the nails in the bar and start, you know, with clip art on their computer for the logo and all that fun stuff, um, they have much more of a, a intrinsic connection to it. It would make a decision like this a little bit harder. Do you think that it was easier for you to make that decision given the, how you came into the company? Yes and no. I mean, we really did reboot the company. We have a we have a different logo. We have a we had a different entity that uh, was paying out the employees. Um, we revisited pretty much every nut and bolt that built this company between 2016 and last year. 
Um, but you know, we didn't, we didn't start Phoenix. We didn't build the name. Neither did the majority owner who exited, uh, it was her former husband. And, uh, Carl was actually very supportive of this cooperative deal. It's, it's something that he thinks is very cool and interesting, uh, even though he didn't have a say in it. Um, and he, he had a dialogue with us along the way. Maybe it, again, he had some distance being retired, uh, and, and exited from the company. But, uh, I, I think that he saw that the thing he built will live on, and that was exciting for him. Mm. I, I think the word generally support is pretty key. At every point of this, pretty much everyone we've talked to from you know, our former ownership group, uh, Carl, Christopher, and myself, our coworkers, you know, uh, partnering institutions, everyone has been generally supportive. Uh, there is a lot to figure out in working these deals and the nuts and bolts that bring up tensions, that bring up conflicts. Uh, but the overall vehicle that is the co-op and that destination point has really been motivating, is a motivating way to work through those tensions. Um, you know, with the business sale, uh, exiting owners look at businesses as their investments, as the retirement. There is a financial component to figure out about how much money you walk away with. Uh, when you exit a business. Um, that was something that we had to figure out with our owner. Um, and the fact that we were working towards something distributive and democratic really helped us get through some of those tension points. Both of our former owners, Carl and Sarah, loved the idea of a co-op as cementing their legacy and continuing it on without their day-to-day -day involvement. Um, and I think it's a balance of those two, you know, and I think it's going to differ with every exiting owner. Uh, one of the struggles that Christopher and I you know, at times have is how much power do we give up? Over four or five years, we've gotten used to making every decision. It's benefited us in many ways. It's good. And we're moving to a more democratic structure where we have to figure out, are there areas that we need to be more distributive? Are there structures that we need to put in place so we can hear things? It's new for us. Um, I fully embrace it. Uh, but there's going to be challenging moments where we're addressed with some of those questions. Um, so a lot of the times, you know, it's just as we get further into the details, that's when the challenges come up and that's when the sticking points come up. But we've really been able to work through every single one of them because everyone was in general agreement that this is a really positive direction for the organization to go in. Nice. That's some good positive momentum to get you over the hump of some of those challenges, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in in when you talk about continued legacy like what you built lives on and you don't necessarily have to be in it day to day that is a very attractive uh proposition for a lot of owners especially as they become weary from you know having to be in the minutia all the time um in you know coffee shops don't necessarily last a very long time to have a 30 year old coffee shop is a rare thing you know, unfortunately, especially in these days, as uh, so many coffee shops are closing. So this is a very interesting uh, example for people to look into. And I, I guess that's my last question to you. If somebody listening to this, an owner or listening to this, or even somebody just going to open a coffee shop or planning on doing it and is interested in this model from the start, what would you say to them would be the first step to take, a good step to take to learn more, and uh, if they're open, maybe even to just transition from where they are now to something similar to what uh, Phoenix is doing? I think, I, I don't know that it necessarily requires anything uh, in, individual other than to read a lot about what, what it means, what it can look like, and to really understand it so it's it's not an, a feared unknown. Um, and the second thing would be to to look at your staff and and really pay attention to your hiring. I mean, ideally, when you hire for a business, you're looking for people who are committed, who are who are capable and who will be at your company long term. And that's the same thing that we're looking for in a co-op structure. I, th I think it's maybe maybe not such such a secret that a lot of coffee operators wish they could pay their staff more. And that is something that a lot of folks wrestle with uh, as, as they operate cafes and they know that if, if they pay their staff more in this business, it, it could come at the expense of other things. And this might be some way to achieve that level of compensation or that share reward uh, during the good times uh, without compromising too much on the idea that you want to build. 
much like Christopher just encouraged to read and have dialogue on what a co-op is, I would encourage all interested parties to just take a deep dive. Uh, from all of my conversations, I haven't found one co-op who did things the same way. Uh, and at its core, a co-op conversion is a business transaction. Uh, and the difficulty in our conversion was all in the business details. Uh, it was a more expensive process than I would hope for. Uh, it was a more tedious process than I would have hoped for. Uh, but, you know, having a large and diverse network of resources that I could reach out through to get through the various issues has really helped. Um, I came in very naive and ideal about what a co-op was. Uh, and it's been a huge learning process the entire time through that honestly took two years to really get down, to get to the point, to push it through the sale and formally establish yourself as a co-op. Um, so I would just say, prepare yourself uh, and talk a lot. You'll get through it, but it's challenging. <laughs> Wise words. Thank you both. Um, this has really been fascinating. I've learned a lot through this conversation. I know the uh, you know, listeners uh, have as well. Where should people go to learn more uh, about Phoenix Coffee? Definitely check out our website, phoenixcoffee.com, or hop over to our Instagram if that's more your speed. Uh, we have three years of transparency reports out. Uh, we're currently working on the, the 2020 report, which is probably going to look a little different with this, this cooperative news. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, give us a try. Excellent. Uh, Christopher, Shane, thank you so much for your time and uh, really appreciate you joining us on the show. Thanks so much for having us, Chris. Thanks a lot, Chris. All right. Well, I hope you found that conversation enlightening in that it helped to um, answer some questions you might have had about uh, cooperative ownership and this model of being an employee-owned cooperative. Certainly, I think this sounds very promising for Phoenix Coffee and everybody involved, especially the staff. Phoenix Coffee is an established company within Cleveland, and it looks like this company, in terms of stability, has taken another step in building resiliency into its model. So a huge thank you to Christopher and Shane for uh, breaking down the details of what's going on there at Phoenix Coffee and giving us some inspiration and clarity through their experiences in pursuing this. So thank you both and best of luck to you and your staff. Now, if you wanna look more into uh, Phoenix Coffee, you can just go to their website, phoenixcoffee.com. And in the show notes, we also have a link to Evergreen Cooperatives, which is a Cleveland-based nonprofit that Phoenix Coffee worked with to get this off the ground. So if you want to learn more about employee-owned worker cooperatives, there's a lot of great information on that website as well. So be sure to check that out. And you can also follow Phoenix Coffee on Instagram at Phoenix Coffee. So if you have any questions or comments or feedback about this episode or others on the show, or you have any inquiries about Keys to the Shop Consulting, again, you can email me, chris at keystotheshop.com. I look forward to hearing from you. And that's the end of this week's episode. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. I hope you have an amazing week. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you Keys to the Shop. <laughs>